All right, everybody. Right, welcome to Rice from the Leadership Blend, where we're simplifying your leadership. All right, everybody, welcome to this week's edition of the Leadership Blend with your host, Ricardo Rice, and my correspondent. Morgan Buckles. It's the one and only Miss Terry Michelle. All right, so on today, we if you can see us, because Facebook Live, IBNX Radio, YouTube Live, you know there's a full studio today. Of course, we have the lovely correspondent. It's a girl's day today. Cause hey. Girl, oh, God. It's, it's, a, it's a girl's day today, so Chris White is out today. Um, so he may be here on Friday, I'm not sure. But he's out today, so it's, it's me, the girls. Actually, there's an even number around me. So there's two girls and there's two guys. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic. So you're saying, who are the guys? All right, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So we have two guests today, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. I'm going to let the, um, the eldest gentleman in the oh, room. It's <laughs> Fair it's enough. That kind of show. Okay. <laughs> now we know. And it only took 45 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> and we're off. Well, I didn't want to subdue Keith. I want Keith Keith. So I figured the only way to stoke the, is to poke the bear. Greetings from it. the elderly side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> this is Keith Ivy. And we have the young buck in the room. So I'm going to let him introduce mm -hmm. himself. Yes, I'm Jordan Rubin. I'm a motivational speaker, produ uh, content producer, and then I also work in IT audit. Okay. And you also have a podcast that Ricardo was featured in, if you want to check that out. Very busy. I mean, you already threw it out there, so you might as well, how can they check it out? Well, they could go to the Apple Store, the iTunes Store, or Google Play Store, or you can look it up on SoundCloud. Oh, you find it in SoundCloud? That's how I got it started. I had SoundCloud, and then... Uh Wait, had what? the links go to the iTunes store, go to the Google Play store. Oh, okay. I didn't know you had SoundCloud because I yeah. put it on mine. All right. <laughs> so thanks. To, okay. I just want to put this on Jordan because I was going to let us have a conversation. And then Jordan asked me about current events. And I was like, you know what? We haven't done current events in a minute. So we're going to do current events today. All right. So there are two things that kind of stuck out. When I was, because you know, I keep NPR, CNN on my phone, so I get like 50,000 notifications. It's no wonder people are depressed. I realized that this weekend. I was like, just being at work and getting all the notifications I got from CNN, talking about earthquakes, 30-something uh, people got shot, I believe, in Chicago. These are the kinds of things I was getting on my phone, I swear, every hour. I was like, it's no wonder people feel like there's no hope in the world. Like, we're getting this much information around the world mm -hmm. every 20 minutes. Like, how do you process, and we talk about this all the time, how do you process that much information if you're 15 or if you're 16 and you're getting not only local stuff that's happening, you're getting worldwide stuff. So you get this perception that the world is a dark place and, and you know, there's all this little light and it's just not enough. So I realized that this weekend and I felt some kind of way about it. And then I started watching cartoons and everything was right in the world. <laughs> <laughs> everything was right again in the world, especially uh, Rick and Morty. Steven yes. Universe, uh, and I just want to say that Rick and Morty is the worst cartoon to ever let a child watch. But it's they, so funny. They drop more f bombs in a little bit. I they bleep it out though. Um, no, they don't. They they do on TV. No, when I watch it, it's in real. I don't form. know where you watched it. I watched but. it on Hulu. Actually, <laughs> yeah, I watched Hulu, it on Hulu. Yeah. And oh, okay, all right. Everything was fair game. I mean, the. The way Rick talks to Morty, I'm oh, just man, like... Oh, man, yeah. It's called Rick and Morty? Yeah, it's... Yep. it's Rick and you Morty. You haven't seen it? Yeah, no, it's... I've it's never, a, seen, oh. never seen yeah, it. Yeah, you, you can mm -hmm. watch that. Keith, have you ever seen Rick and Morty? They do not let the elderly watch that. <laughs> <laughs> the retirement home uh, didn't no, let you... They, oh, no, they... We've got, we got to talk uh, to Shady Pines about in that. In fact, I've got, to get, I, I've got to get back to the, the car. The car will be here any moment now to take you back. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's got awful. But it's the funniest thing. It's just the language is atrocious. It's It's... It's Adult Swim. So anybody that knows Cartoon Network, when you see Adult Swim, just know it's nothing your kids should be watching. It's absolutely for adults. It's nothing your kids should be watching. So I just want to point that out. All right. So this weekend in news, it looks like, all right, for those that do not know about DACA, which we, we're getting into the immigration thing again. Um, <clears throat> all right. So we know for months. We've been uh, dealing with this whole immigration debacle and, and uh, people being sent back to where they quote unquote came from, Mexico, those kinds of, of places. And uh, we get into DACA. So what is DACA? DACA was created in 2012 from an executive order from President Barack Obama. So anybody knows that about President Trump, anything that Obama did, President Trump pretty much hates. It doesn't matter what his purpose was. It doesn't matter why it was created. He's pretty much going to hate it, and he's going to do anything to get it repealed. 
Um, so the repealing of DACA is what kind of started a lot of this year, or trying to get it repealed from the current administration. All right, so this program allowed hundreds of thousands of young people who were brought to the United States illegally as children to remain in the country. Applicants cannot have any serious criminal histories, uh, must have arrived in the United States before 2007 when they were under the age of 16. DACA recipients can live and work legally in the United States for a renewable two-year period. All right, so who has signed up? As many as 800,000 so-called dreamers, which is where you hear the term dreamers, that's where it comes from. Uh, as many as 800,000 so-called dreamers have applied to join the initiative since its, in since its inception. Immigration rights advocates, advocates have asked some 200,000 more have sought DACA protection since Donald Trump became president. Some experts have said the program could end up covering 1.3 million young people if they were allowed to continue. Requests for renewals are now being filed at the rate of almost 8,000 a week. So that's how many people were applying to get into this uh, protection. All right, so Trump decided that he announced on Tuesday that he was going to end, well, this, this article is kind of older. So he announced that he was going to end DACA. So basically, he wanted to send everybody back. Um, he was, they stopped taking applications. They stopped dealing with it. He pretty much had closed the whole office down. So that's when you start seeing people being sent back, especially that's why you saw so many kids, because the kids were under the protection of DACA. So that's where the whole kids debacle come in for those that were wondering, well, why are we seeing so many kids, and why is it majority kids? Because that's who was under the, uh, the protection of DACA. Okay, so I actually have a question. Yes. So is it, um, well, I know they're not, they're not, they really weren't called concentration camps for the kids, right. but um, like the ones, the examples of the pictures that we saw, is yeah. that from like the kids that were part Taken? of Taken, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. it is? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So they were taking the kids and putting them in camps. Now, the correlation for those that are familiar with history, like I'm sure we are, uh, you cannot <laughs> keep doing that. that. I Pete, promise you, that was you, not a dig. You day. walked right into that one. I'm going to show you that this was not a dig. <laughs> Watch this. How many people are familiar with the Holocaust? Everybody. I was right, hoping tell me what it in is. this room. Somebody it tell me what it is. The like Holocaust was a horrible act in history that happened in Germany where Adolf Hitler gathered up all of the, the Jews, Jews. Yeah. and, you know, I don't they put him in concentration. Um, concentration. Well, I mean, <laughs> he, he was, I don't want to just be as blunt can. to say he was killing them off, but like, if that just seems insensitive, but he was. It I genocide. Like That's essentially was, what was happening. Yeah, genocide like was in yeah, like six million genocide Jews in were Germany. Yeah, we're close. Time. Yeah. I, okay, so I'm impressed. The, it was the attempt to eradicate the face of the earth of Jews. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Literally. Ricardo, you kind of doubted us. So what's wrong? We're all familiar with this. It seems. I would hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I was. I thought it would be a passing familiarity, but y'all actually, I'm kind of impressed. Yeah, Slightly. Yeah. I am too. I, I'm actually there, impressed. There I thought are my a lot guys. of yeah. much younger people <laughs> who do not know the history mm -hmm. of that experience, plus the history of a lot of other experiences in the world, where various power people tried to get rid of the, the powerless. Well, to back you, I guess to kind of back you up, to back you, support your little theory, that's kind of true just a little bit because I didn't actually learn about it until like a few years ago, maybe like two, three really? years ago. Yeah. So mm -mm. I, knew what I didn't even know about it like in school, like when it was actually like going on and stuff because I seen like a video of it. Right. Um, my teacher showed us like when we was in school, like maybe two years ago. And I, before then, I didn't even know anything about it either. So. Well, for those that are not familiar, there's a movie called The Diary of Annie Frank. So that's typically either between that or Schindler's List. Schindler's List, that's them, the one. That, yeah. It's usually between mm -hmm. the two of them that people will show it to show the, the recollection of what exactly happened. But it was a terrible time in history. And like he said, he pretty much tried to eradicate Jews. They were literally, to see the pictures are horrific. They were put in what was called concentration camps where I think they took like gas showers. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. And you could see the bodies, the pictures of the bodies being dumped in wheelbarrows in like landfills. It, it was that serious. And... Yeah, it, it's when whenever you look at the study of leadership and you look at charismatic leadership, this is where you start crossing into people like uh, Adolf Hitler and people like that because they're so charismatic that people will follow them. It doesn't matter what the message is. They're so charismatic that people will follow them. And it's is, the craziest uh, thing. People and, keep comparing him to Trump. They com they're comparing our government these days. Well, the bottom line, too, I think that we have to remember about the Holocaust is that the, the theme that we take away from it is that we should never forget that this happened... The, basically a long time ago, but it didn't happen that long ago. Yeah. And we should never forget the, the capacity 
of people to be picked up and swayed by cult leaders. Hitler was a cult leader. And whatever, whatever he was able to do, he was able to grab a lot of people mm -hmm. and cause them to violate their own principles, their own rules of, of how to live life, and to lay them aside and to behave in ways that they would have never behaved had there not been a Hitler. And it's, it's the most dangerous type of leadership there is. Like it's, it's, and when I do the comparison, I use it for, lack of, for a current day example. I uh, use Barack versus Hitler because both of them are charismatic leaders. But Barack used his to do what he needed to do to, you know, in essence, try to better the country, whereas Hitler tried to further his own agenda. And it's amazing. And when you start spewing heat, hate, you'd be amazed at the people who are sitting in the wings waiting for that kind of leader. So when that happened, they were in the wings, and next thing you know, it's a movement. It's, it's, like I said, if you've never seen Schindler's List, you definitely want to watch it. And then there's a book, The Diary of Annie Frank, which they made a movie. But Anne I read the Frank. book. I want you to stop calling her Annie. Like I mean, Annie like Frank. You know I know. You were better. Than <laughs> I was a kid. They were very close. I was a kid. <laughs> so I, I always called Annie. Anne Frank. It's, it's amazing. I actually read the book. I didn't watch the movie on that one. I read the book. And it was like a child's recollection of what happened. It's the most amazing thing. And it's. Children are the most resilient creatures on earth. I'm convinced. Like they can live through stuff. And even when we had um, the sex trafficking, Katie was here. She mm -hmm. relived her account of sex trafficking, and she'd been in that thing since she was eight years old. And she's 28 now, and she just got out like a year or two ago, being abused by her father, all that good, st all that terrible stuff. And she was still going to school. Like she was literally going to high school with all that going on, being sold to different men. She was still going to high school and functioning. Like n nobody knew. It's the craziest thing. So I'm convinced that kids are the most resilient creatures. All right. So that takes us to the current situation with immigration. Mm -hmm. So this is why the parallel has been made between what's going on with DACA and the Holocaust. Um, so I don't think I said it. So DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program. That's what DACA stands for. So uh, what happened was on Friday, the federal judge from Washington, D.C., uh, it's pretty much making Trump reinstate DACA. That's pretty much what happened. They were saying that their basis for closing it down was not good enough and that they have, I think, 20 days to repeal it. So pretty much they have 90 days to reinstate it. They gave them a time limit to try to repeal it. But at this point, it's unfounded. So shouts out to federal judges that have the authority to overrule what's happening. So. It should be reinstated. So that means all these kids that are kind of wayward and, and being in uh, these camps in cages, which I still don't know how we got the cages. But apparently these kids were in cages, um, will probably be reinstated. So the ongoing fight has been that the government, the federal courts are saying, OK, you need to reinstate these families. So that's become an ongoing battle as well. So reinstating DACA will help in this whole debacle. But it's, it's a whole sifting, and trust me, it'd be a whole nother show just to get to that. So, thoughts? So, are they going back to their parents? Well, they or? have to find their parents because they separated them. So, the kids went to one uh, area, the parents went to another one. So, some of these parents have actually been deported. So, it's, it's right, a whole nother. Right, which is nother, even worse. The, yeah, the, it's the a whole The bottom nother. line to this is that these, there's a lot of these kids who are going to grow up without their parents. Mm -hmm. They're going to die at the old age of 100 having no idea where their parents went. And there will come a day when people study American history. I will not live to see this, but there will be a day when children are in school studying American history, and this period of time is going to be 25 pages. And children are going to wonder, what in the world were those people us what were they thinking what were they doing how could this have happened in a country that purports to be the land of the free and the home of the brave when will america start living up to its billing to its press we are we have this this image in the world where we want to be the shining light on the hill and instead we are the dumpster behind the restaurant and I trouble, you know, I'm so glad I'm 72 years old and I will not live to see how this ends because I don't think I will. I, I think this is going to go on for a lot longer. 
which is really yeah. like worrying. Yeah, it makes pe- like if, for people my age. I don't. It, I don't want to bring children into a world like this. Yeah, I don't want to. I, I, I agree. I, I don't want to. I don't want to expose anyone else to this hell. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just not. You don't because how do you? Even though you said children are the most resilient, how do you explain that to a child? And imagine the children who are actually going, going through, through it. it. That's a trauma that you don't really. We can't explain because we've never experienced it. So how do you help someone else get past that? And think about those people who are now not from here, but they want to come over here for a better chance or a better like life. They get here and they're treated like animals, and now you expect them to get over it after you say, oh, okay, well, we're sorry. We released you. Like We didn't really mean it. You can go free from the cages. But how do you move past that? And that's how a lot of chaos start and people begin to think with like alternative motives and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like... Because they've been kept in cages and they don't, you know what I'm saying? They don't know how to act on being inside of that type of cage. So if you think if you're inside of a cage and something happens and when you get out, when you get free, you don't you don't have no parents. Like at this point you're just lost. So you don't know what to do. So is the program actually gonna like help them as far as that? Because you not that was a good point. Like they're gonna be without their kid without their parents for a while. So How's that go? Do they go into like foster care or? Well, some of them. So I think the way that it was working before with DACA, it's supposed to, if you come over here illegally, you're allowed the two year like work mm-hmm. permit or something like that. So if you are here now or we're a part of like the camps or something, say you're eight years old, like you can't work anyway. Right. But some of those children had families or family members that were already over here. Mm-hmm. So like maybe aunts or cousins or grandparents, things of that nature. So a lot of those children who were reported like missing, like you know how they were saying that a lot of children were just getting lost in the system and we, mm-hmm. they had no idea where they were. Well, think of if I'm if I'm an immigrant and my some of my family's already over here and I know that you've said like I bring my or my niece comes over here with my sister or something. If you've already sent my sister back and now you give my niece to me, why would I report to the government where my niece is? Because you may try to take her too. So I think that a lot of those children, well, not even I think a lot of those children have gone on to like be with their family members who are already here. But a lot of those children have ended up in foster cares, have been sent back home, have been are are still separated from their families. And I don't know if they've even kept good enough track to be able to, you know, replace like relocate that. I think the answer to that is no. They had when this policy was instituted, no thought was given to what do we do next. When right. we take this child away from this mother, we separate them and we send the mother back to wherever and we've got the child here. What do we do now? Yeah, it got gotten so and bad. And after we do that, what do we do then? This was the most incredibly incompetent expression of behavior expressed by an adult. These were adults who made this decision. This was not a group of, of 10-year-olds at the playground. Not These just are adults. adults. These are leaders. Who, who are, they got jobs because they were business people. And True. yet... They didn't run this like a business. They ran this like a, I don't know what the word would be. I was waiting to see what you were going to come up with. But if these people worked I, if in my company, if, if I had a project that required this type of planning and this guy over here pulls this project off with no planning, he's on the street or dead. I'm not really sure which I would go for, but, but he's <laughs> not going. And yet in our government, you can screw things up like this and still get up and come to work tomorrow because you've got a job. Where else in the world do people like that stay employed and stay respected? I don't get that. Yeah, it got so bad to the point that they were making children like represent themselves in court. Yeah, it was. that they were taking it like once they were separate. Yeah, yeah. once they were separating the what? children. So they were literally having them go to court. I watched a, a reenactment of one because obviously they don't allow like cameras in the courtroom. But they would have the children go in there. They would ask them, "Do you literally do you know that you are representing yourself?" Of course, the children have no idea. Do and like just trying to ask them simple questions. But what do you? You're probably they're terrified. They're completely unaware of what's really going on. They don't know the severity of the situation. As far as they're concerned, they're probably just scared to death and want their parents back or where their families. They just want to know. Something familiar. They want to be back to where they were, and it's just, it's so sad. Well, you got they me. want to know, what is your mother's name? Mommy. Exactly. You know, These especially. Kids don't know what like, their I don't even, I barely know are. this. I don't even know the language. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And now you expect me to, it just makes no sense. Now, what's the age limit to where they actually force the kid to stay in America? Like, if they're 16 or 17, they're technically a child, they're technically a kid. 
do they get some say in whether or not they want to stay or go with their family? Well, you well, got to remember, the... most of these kids, all they know is America. They were brought here when they were kids. So this is, to them, this is home. So, so now they're saying to him, well, yeah, well, this is home because you were brought here, but you're really from Mexico. So you got to go back to Mexico. And these kids are like, I don't know Mexico. I've been here since I was a kid. Right. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's mm. kind of a, this law is passed five years later, because I think this was 2012. That, that was done in 2012. But with, like, the ages and, like, the statute of limitations, I think that's, like, what he's yeah, asking. Exactly. Like, so with the, the with DACA and the Dreamers Act, so, like, the Dreamers Act is, like, if you come over here as a child and you are, you basically end up enrolled in school, you can stay until mm-hmm. you finish. If you, with the, with DACA, when you come over here, um, you get a two-year, like, you're eligible for a two-year work permit. So if you're, obviously, if you're a child, the Dreamers Act would, like, work more for you. DACA is more so, like, if I'm 20 and I bring my two-year-old over here. I'm allowed to stay, but without DACA, now they send you home and your child is separated from you. That's why, like, it was such a big thing. Mm. Okay, I get it now. So during that period where DACA was revoked and now it's being reinstated, a right. lot of those parents went back Absolutely. and now they're trying to get some of them back. Right. Now it's just a whole mess is what you're saying. Yes. Well, it's like imagine you're living your life and then this ruling comes through and now all of a sudden you're being pulled out of school and your parents are being pulled off their jobs, you're being thrown mm-hmm. in the back of a van, and you're in a cage, and your parents are somewhere across the border of Mexico. That's kind of became their reality. So for as far as, like, with the Dreamers program, um, were those kids taken as well? No. Those, no. Those no. kids are still here. Yeah, they're still in oh, okay. school. Yeah. Okay, okay. But I think now, they, they did try to repeal that at one point, too. Yeah. They were trying yeah. to get rid of that, like, mm-hmm. a, a year or two ago, I think. But I think we have to ask the question, what is the motivation be t- behind behavior? What is the motivation behind decisions? Why would someone want to take uh, a mother and a child and separate them and then get send the mother back to wherever she came from? What is the p- What are we trying to accomplish? What are we afraid of? What are we afraid that that mother, that woman, is going to do to our country? Yeah, it's I systemic. It's like once you have a certain like picture of somebody in your mind and they have this, they've perpetuated this all throughout the media, they have an idea of what they think Mexicans or Hispanics or Latina people, Latina, Latino people are worth, and they don't want those kind of people in this country. They feel like anything that is, you know, different from whatever they feel makes America great again, they don't want any parts of it. Well, I don't think it's specifically those types of people. I think it's people, at least this is from the Trump administ- administration, he wants to make sure that there are national borders and that only Americans are in. And I don't think he really understands that people aren't just trying to take our jobs here in America. Like, the situation in America, just the overall situation is better than what it is in Mexico. Like, there's all those drug cartels, and Mm -hmm. I hear all those stories, and they're not safe down there. So they finally make it out of that situation and finally make it to America only to not be able to pursue their dream and be sent back. So I think that's that's what that's why they want to come to America, but Trump's seeing it more as we are one country, this is our nation and wants to block it off to only Americans or quote unquote legal citizens. I think it goes deeper than that. I think Trump wants a white America. He wants a country that is composed of white, bright Europeans. He does not want a country composed of Mexicans uh, or anybody from La- a Latin American country for whatever reason. I don't know if he, if a, a Latin American woman stood him up once. <laughs> I don't know what pissed him off, but something did because he has this fixation on a, a white country. And the bad news for him is he's not going to get it. At all. It's not going to happen. That. Yeah. Way past that, that. That boat left a long time ago. There's no, that's not going to happen. So he just needs to get with the program, or we need to get somebody with a new program. Well, I mean, but then you have to look at, and this is where it's so important, where people that are in government are reflective of what you see. Um, when you walk down the street, like I said, you don't see just white people. You don't see just black people, for that matter. You see a mm-hmm. melting pot of people when you walk down the street. So your government has to be reflective of what you see on a day-to-day basis. Basis. So when you put somebody like a Donald Trump in office who's had money pretty much all their life, and they're a to making calls and shots based off what they want to do, and you put them in office, what did we expect? And we got to think about what he ran off. 
his biggest thing was, I'm going to build a wall to keep them out. That was the primary thing he kept saying. I'm going to build this wall, and I'm going to put people out. And I guess with, the more you talk about the more it does seem Holocaust, Holocaust-ish because that's kind of what Hitler said. Look, we're going to get rid of all the Jews, and anybody that's with me, let's go. And you got all these people out of the woodworks, which is kind of what happened with Trump. Bigots and racists, people we thought had been long gone, came out of the woodwork. And you're just like, I didn't know you were still around. You know, I didn't know you still felt this way. And there was a resurgence. So now you're seeing it. You're seeing it in the legislation that's trying to be passed. You see it in what's happening in your local government. It's an amazing, it's an amazing, not in a good way, time in history, because you just you see the power of group thinking. Because this Absolutely. specific group mm-hmm. feels this way, now we've allowed them to come to power. I saw that a lot, like being on Auburn's campus. It was you go to the university and you think, Oh, I'm I'm in a place where these are People who are broad thinkers, they're here to learn, they're here to expand their minds, and they are, because of that, they are accepting of things, or at least more understanding, or at least try to be. And as soon as Trump decided to let people know he was running for office, it was like he gave license to a whole entire different kind of energy. It was like campus completely changed for that entire period, and he was campaigning up until the moment he won, and even thereafter, it was just different. Things were different, being in Alabama, obviously living in the South, things are just different down here anyway. It's not, we live a different kind of life. Yeah, and, we do. But being in Alabama, like, I obviously, yeah, I knew people are racist and things happen. People say things and do things, but whatever. And then, but after he decided to let people know and, like, the whole Make America Great Again, the wall, all of that, it was, you, people lose their, they lost their minds. It was like all the education, does not matter how smart you are, does not matter how many books you read. If you, hate is hate, and if it, like, People felt in, not entitled, but yes, entitled to that hatred because they felt like, oh well, if the most powerful man in the world can say these things, why can't I? Well, one of the when I was a kid, and from then, you know, being a child until the last few years, racist had the courtesy of keeping it to themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They had the courtesy of keeping it with their community, mm-hmm. and you could have your best friend being a racist, but you wouldn't know it because. They sort of knew that you weren't into that, so they sort of, okay, we're going to dial that down when I'm with him, mm-hmm. and we're going to amp it up when I'm over here. Right. Exactly. But something happened when Trump became president. It became okay mm-hmm. not only to be a racist, but to get on a soapbox and to announce it, to wear the shirts that say, I'm a racist, yeah. and to be in the KKK. And it happened just like that. It was like overnight it was okay to be who you were, I frankly like it better now. I like knowing at least I know. who my yeah. racist mm-hmm. friends are. Yeah. I know, I didn't know that 10 years ago, but I know now. It really bothers me too, because I think people, one thing I totally learned being on campus was, I I take that as a form of violence against myself. Because if I see you with a Make America a Greater hat on again, I'm walking the other way. You know what I'm saying? It was like, even shirts with Confederate flags or whatever, I'm going in the other direction because I see that as you have a problem with me. Whether you want to explicitly say it or not, I take that as a hate crime against myself and people of color or whoever else you feel is out, stands own. outside of that lines that you consider great. Mm-hmm. I don't appreciate that. But I've said this before, and I feel like I'm going to say it again. And I blame the people. Like, I blame us because, you know what I'm saying, like, things, like, for example, with the, the wall. He said he was going to do that. You know, like, Trump is just basically doing all the things that he said he was going to do. And now that he's doing it, everybody's kind of like, wow, I can't believe this is happening. And in the meantime, I do feel like it's kind of bringing it's bringing people closer together. And then let me explain when I say that. Because, like, you have um, you have all these different type of groups. Like, you have, like, um, organizations like Black Lives Matter. Or then you have, like, people that's you know, make America great again, like whoever, you're getting everybody to be unified, but it's just. It's, yeah, but it's across lines. Yeah, like so it's, it's. It's making you pick a side. At this but point. at the same time, it's still something like, like I said, we knew this was going to happen. Like everybody knew he was going to build a wall. We knew eventually, like, I don't, I want to say not, not the kids. I didn't know it was going to get that extreme. But at the same time, it's like, we kind of knew some of this stuff was going to happen. It's like, now that it's happening, it's just like, so what, what are we going to do? Like, yeah, but, but even knowing that that was going to happen, the majority of the people in America who voted, voted against him. He did not win the popular vote. Yeah, he didn't win Most the popular vote. Most people in America 
did not want him. So we are saddled with this, this structure called the um, electoral, electoral college, college, which I've never understood why it's either electoral or college. Okay. These are two <laughs> words that mean nothing related to what they're doing. Um, there's got to be another phrase for that, and I'm not sure it's appropriate on radio. Oh, God. Then. Uh, but I'll come up with that. <laughs> but we are saddled with that so that in the next election cycle, unless more people vote, more millennials vote. 50% of the American population who are eligible to vote don't vote. Yeah. yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. It's not, you know, Trump's not the problem. The problem is we've got too many people in America who just don't care. All they care about is what's going on in their little lives. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. I care what's going on in my little life too. But my little life is impacted by what's going on in your life. Mm -hmm. In your life. Our lives impact me, and mine impact you. We are, we're all in the same boat. We're just in different places in the boat. And if the boat sinks, we're all going to get wet. Right. And that's what, what really, like, tripped me out almost. Once, I, I had friends who have voted for Obama, people who I knew were, like, active and at least keeping up with politics or current events and just knowing what was going on in their world. And as soon as it came time to vote between, like, Trump and Clinton, they didn't even want to go to the polls. It was just like, oh, it's whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm kind of – we're – damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. Like, I don't really yeah. want either yeah. one of them. And yeah. I, it, it really just, it shook me because it's like, that's exactly what I mean when I say it kind of, it created this environment. Like, that type of, once you, like I said, it gave license to people who felt like they could say whatever and who, if they wanted to express hate, they could. And with that, like I said, it's a form of violence against me because now if people like, like me now feel like they are stifled. They can't say anything. It doesn't matter if I vote because Trump's going to do me in and so is Clinton. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that, you never want to have that. In America, that's not the point of it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of people who did vote weren't necessarily voting for one person, but they were they voting against, against the, the other, other one, the person. lesser yeah. of yeah. two evils. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, that, that's that kind of what. But I mean, it, the reality is if you go back to that election, if you look at portfolios, I think people looked at it with different eyes. Those mm -hmm. of us that understand politics went, well, it's a clear winner. Hillary has been around for the, for decades. She's been on all areas, all branches of, of government. She's been with her husband, who was president. But if you looked at it from a business standpoint, people went, yeah, but she's never really run anything, per se. And Trump has kind of run stuff. And I think that's where people were, because I hear still hear people talk about it now. It's like, well, he's run a successful business. He has Trump Towers. Everybody knows his name. And then I really think, I mean, and people thought I was crazy when I said it, and then they started talking to folks like, yeah, you might have been right. People felt like they knew Trump. A lot of them had watched The Apprentice. They thought he was funny. They thought, you know, like, oh, he's the kind of guy. Because at the end of the day, people vote saying, would I want to have a drink with, with my president? You know, is, is, is he charismatic enough? Somebody I really want to say I'm proud to have as a president. And I think people felt like they knew, people who were uninformed, felt like, you know what, I kind of know Trump. I watched The Apprentice. He's a cool guy. You know, I like Trump Towers. I don't think they thought about it from a, this man will, will have to be a diplomat. He'll have to run the country. He'll have to maintain, you know, relationships across seas. I don't think they understood that aspect of it, so here we are. But on that note, we're going to take our first break, and when we come back, we're going to talk more about what's going on in the country on the Leadership Blend with your host, Ricardo D. Rice.
everybody. It's Ricardo D. Rice from the Leadership Blend, simplifying your leadership. All right, bye. We are back on this week's edition of the Leadership Blend with your host, Ricardo D. Rice, and my correspondent, Morgan Buckle, Terry Michelle, and our guest, Jordan Rubin, and Keith Ivey. All right, so when we went on break, we were getting into this whole discussion of uh, DACA and immigrants and comparisons to the Holocaust, and it just paints a picture that's not that great. Um, all right, so we're going to segue to another part. People don't understand it's a domino effect. So because of the, the lack of immigrants who, in essence, do certain jobs that I don't want to say Americans are less prone to do, but Americans are less prone to do. <laughs> but, do you know, but it's also because I think that, like, with the with millennials and every generation after this, they encourage us to go to school and get mm -hmm, degrees yeah. and, like, work harder and do more things. So, of course, I spend all this money on a degree. I'm not getting ready to go back and, you know, be shoveling dirt. That's not what I paid all this money for. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I think it's about what we were taught, too, because we were told that, too. But we also were also taught that if you have to start at the bottom, it's okay. So we didn't mind going to school and working at McDonald's. Or we didn't mind going to school and working at Burger King. Right, you guys have better options. For Exactly. Well, well again, <laughs> again, you know, the times are different. So, I mean, you guys, and I think I was talking to somebody about this the other day. You know, I kept seeing signs, and it's not uncommon, but I kept seeing signs for Burger King, McDonald's, not hiring, not hiring, not hiring. And I went through the drive through and I'm like, okay, I'm used to seeing a, a 17 or 18 year old give me food. You're in your 50s and 60s giving me food. I was like, how did we get to this place? But now I was like, oh, when you talk about millennials, Generation Z, maybe Generation X and Y, not so much, and you start talking about information, companies realize really quickly I can pay a millennial to run my social media because I don't understand, which mostly the people in those positions are baby boomers or Generation X and Generation Y. So they go, well, I don't understand information, but I know this millennial does, so I can pay this senior in high school or this freshman in college to maintain my social media. So now these kids are making a lot of money mm -hmm. out the gate. So there's no incentive to go work in a McDonald's or to go work in a Burger King. So I'm like, okay, how does that affect that industry? Because, I mean, we'll do it if we have to, because that's... But add to that the fact that we, you know, people like me are living longer. Yeah. And we did not live our lives necessarily in a way that would allow for to live longer. Yeah. I never expected to be 72. When I I, you, I I, you what does that still, feel like? It feels like, how did the world did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I found out the other day that my son is 42. So how did I <laughs> he, in his company, they call him Old Man Ivy. What, oh, what does that boy. make me? Wow. The older man the, Ivy. Yeah, yeah, the way way older man. <laughs> but, you, but, but when I was in my 40s, I did not expect to live past 60. Mm -hmm. And so retirement, I never expected to retire. And now I'm going to live up to that expectation. I'll never <laughs> retire. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, boy, yeah. I mean, it, but it changes the dynamic. And, and it's, again, so what do we do? And I was, again, having, because, you know, I have to talk to people all the time, unfortunately. And we had that conversation. It was like, well, I never thought about, like, I'm almost 40. And I think in your 20s, you feel invincible. So it's just like retirement. For I sure. Retirement. Mm -hmm. For I'm sure. I'm good. I'm going to live forever. Spend it now. I'm going to work forever. <laughs> and then you start getting 30, and all the dreams you had, you're just like, okay. Once you hit 30, it's like, is this really going to happen? Or you're like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I got a little more time, so we good. We're going to keep going. I'm going to make this thing happen. Then you get to 37, you're just like, okay, it's almost 40. Yeah. And the things that I really want to do, they may not happen so now I need to think about what to do. Well, you've lost 20 years when you could have been having a pumping and, and priming 401k. And see, I think that's the difference between like our generation and yours. Like we are learning from, thank God y'all made all those mistakes because now we know what to do. <laughs> wait a minute, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because it's not all of y'all. Y'all are, that is not the status quo. I'm there for thank you. Thank you, thank you. Y'all are because, not, the, it's not the yeah, status quo. I'm telling you, like now, I'm like, so I do feel invincible. I absolutely do. But I'm even looking at my savings account like, mm, I could probably add another dollar here, another dollar there because I don't want to work forever. And like, I'm reading this book now called Broke Millennial. And it's helping me like with saving and like yeah, just retirement funds and things like that. Exactly, I'm not, but I know. But in reading this book and just like talking to some of my friends about it, I've realized a lot of my friends are really not that bad at money management. Now, they may yeah. not have a lot of it, but I think because like we didn't, you've been broke before. You don't want to be yeah. broke again. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. you, you've been there. You don't want to go back. So it's like even watching maybe your parents or your grandparents and their struggles. 
work into their 60s, 70s, and however long they live on this earth, you don't want to be like that, so you have to make a difference. Something else, too, I think is generational. My parents never talked about money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We were poor, but I didn't know it. Mm-hmm. As I look back on it, I know why we had soup for breakfast. Oh, wow. Is that- but when I was a kid, having soup for breakfast was, that's what we do. Yeah. I assumed everybody in the neighborhood did the same thing. We yeah. talk about it. I don't, my parents never talked about money. I think your parents probably talk, have talked more about money and finances and how the, mm-hmm. the, the business of a family runs. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. When you get married, you are creating a corporation. Absolutely. And that corporation has bylaws <laughs> and it has rules and you may not know what they are, but there's and there's financial and I think it's great that you are learning uh, more aware than I was at your age about what money That's was all about. Awesome. Speaking of finances, this is perfect for what I read on Twitter this weekend. So there was a you might have seen it. There was this whole thing. There was like these set of screenshots, a couple a woman and a woman, a woman who had children, had maybe like two children from previous relationships, and she was just starting to date this new guy or whatever. So her children needed to go on a field trip or something small, petty. She didn't have the money for it immediately. She asked the guy she was dating for $20. Hey, can I borrow $20 for my kids in their field trip? Can I send them on it? He said, no, I'm not giving you $20 because that's your responsibility. And if they need $20, you better be asking their fathers. And she was like, well, Obviously, if they had it, I would. Like, I don't think the fathers were maybe that much in the children's lives. She just wanted to. It's a field trip. It's $20. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't give it to her. And he was like, yeah, you need to be more responsible. Ask their um, dads. I'm not doing that. Like, you're not my wife. I'm da-da-da-da-da. And I thought that was insane. Like, first of all, sis, you need a new man. (laughs) And secondly, you might need a new job, too, because if you don't have $20, but that's just the thing. Like, with children, and that's another reason why I don't want to have children. So, they were dating? They are dating, yes. Uh, They may not be dating after this weekend, but they were prior prior to that text message. How would you feel about that? Would you give you, I would have just given her the $20. I would have given her $60. Like, you shouldn't ever have to ask me for $20. But that's what you would do with a friend. Yeah. If you need $20, bucks, i am going to help you. If I've got it, you've got it. Exactly. Especially if it's for kids, though. Right. Right, you yeah, know, and he but, was being so mean but about it. But this is where I get, I tell people, this is where the line gets drawn between people being married and people dating or cohabitating. When you're married, I still feel like it's, a, yes, a piece of paper, it's a legal document. You're more prone to do things. When I'm dating you and you got two or three kids and they got three different fathers and they're not involved and we're just dating and I'm already doing enough. I'm going to be more prone to say something like that. What's doing enough, though? What's Sleeping with me? You don't have a problem getting in my bed, so I don't have a problem getting in my but, wallet. But I don't want to hear it. A no, man no, no. is only going to do what he's allowed to do. So if you allow him Mm-mm. to be in your bed. Listen, that's why I said, sis, we're not talking about me. This was her. I would have <laughs> never. First of all, I would never need to ask well, we for the $20. You, we and know I know you don't sure. really want to get married and you don't want kids. Period. So. If I, listen, if he didn't have me $20 to give me. He be long gone. You know, let's, you always the exception. Let's go to Terry. <laughs> <laughs> You're always the exception. Let's go to Terry. Sometimes Terry falls into the status quo. So, Terry, what do you think? I mean, for me personally, I'm a agree with Morgan. If you don't got $20 to get, like, no, seriously, if I ask you, I'm the, the type of person that I am, I wouldn't ask unless I really, like, need it. Yeah. So, if she was doing that for her kids, I just feel like he, you're, we're dating. You know what I'm saying? Like, you could have do that for my kids. So, that's just me. We don't have the backstory, so I feel like there, there's we don't know the backstory because right. there could what be, backstory do you need? He could be taking care of all the bills in the house, and he's already no, stressed in these too messages, thin. In these messages, he wasn't making it seem like yeah, that. and he was making it seem her. like he just didn't want to do it because it wasn't his responsibility. Yeah, but who screenshot the message was? Did he, he screenshot did. or she did? He did. Oh, he did. So yes. wait, why would he want it trending? Yeah, exactly. Because she would he, be the he one. put it on fa- he, he put it on Facebook like, and was and asking people right. like, "Do you think I'm in the wrong for yeah. not giving her this money?" And Pete, some people agree. Some, a lot of men, you know, younger men like agree, like, "Oh, because that's the whole thing now. I'm not paying for it." Like yeah. just because we sleeping together does not mean I have to give you any money. But <sighs> I mean, like, technically, you're gonna if pay they, eventually. If they check. My daddy you... said this the other day. If you I think that you are going to date somebody or sleep with anybody for free, it's impossible. You will end up paying for it. Eventually, you're going to fix a tire. You're going to put gas in my car. You're going to take me to dinner. Down, get a hair like, You know what I'm saying? Like, it's going to come around something. eventually. So if I ask for this $20 for this field trip, baby, if you don't have it, I, that means you are you can't do anything for me. And honestly, I feel like when you're dating or in a relationship, I think that's part of a job. You get what I'm saying? Like, when you're, like, honestly, like let's put it, um, not from men, point, from a girl, point. So, like, if you're a girl, girl's point of view. So, say, if you know, you're a woman or whatever, and you have a man, like, and maybe y'all living together. 
as a woman, there's just certain roles that a man expects you to play. Like, say if you're, if he wants breakfast, you know, say he paying all the bills or whatever, but he wants dinner and breakfast, lunch, or whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's just his certain feet things rug, that you, yeah, like, it's just certain <laughs> things you have to do. So I just feel like if you're dating someone and you know that they have kids, then you know what responsibilities come with that. You know what I'm saying? One morning, you might have to drop the kids off at school. One day, you might have to, she's running late from work, so you might have to go pick them up. It's just, that's a partnership. Like, that's something not, you're going to have to not do. To yeah, that Saturday you asked me to take off work last week and go out on that date, I could have had my $20 for my future. <laughs> so give me my money First or get off my phone. I don't think phone. no man can take you out with $20. I'm just Period. Like, not Period. You. Period. Not you. Period. Like $200. We couldn't, you couldn't even take me to the mailbox, baby. That was $20. <laughs> Jordan, but yeah, I mean, if you're dating someone with kids with the intention of marrying this person. But I think that's the key, though. What's the intent? Yeah. Is the intent to be married or are y'all just dating? Because if I'm dating you, I'm not obligated to take care of your kids. If Dating. That's not as true. I mean, not the truth be told, it depends on the woman. Clearly, sis didn't have good taste in men if her it baby daddy didn't have twenty dollars and neither did her new boyfriend. You're still twenty dollars. So I'm just saying. But you're still sort of the male figure in those kids' <laughs> lives. Yeah. Like you still gotta at least do. You're not obligated, but you should help out where you but can. But it's a two way street. If you don't have these kinds of conversations, and this is where I mean, because I have two sisters, and one of my sisters actually, well, one of them's married. The other one has two kids, and we talk about this all the time. There's got to be active communication that say, mm -hmm. okay, we're dating, but if you feel like we're a set deal, because there are some women whose fathers, they have different fathers for their kids, but those fathers are actually active. So right. when they get in a relationship, they have to have that conversation. Look, these kids are not looking for a father because these two kids, they have two different daddies, but Jamal and Takim, they're active <laughs> in their lives. So we're not looking for a baby daddy. I'm not looking for you to play a father figure. You're here for me. Then there are people on the other side who are looking for a father figure for their kids, and it's a conversation you got to have. It can't be assumed that just because I'm dating you, you have kids, I'm supposed to be their role model. That can't be assumed. you got to have that conversation. But, See, but you un know, unfortunately, I'm a lot of people do assume that. Yeah. And then instead of having those conversations, They'll just, hey, take a screenshot of our messages, post it on Twitter. Let's see what the rest of the world thinks. <laughs> that, that, apparently, well, that's the way to solve conflict if, these if, days. If, if you are my friend, if you're my girlfriend, if you're my wife, no matter what is, I don't care what the form of our relationship is, if you're in a situation where $20 is going to make a difference mm -hmm. and I've got $20, I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. Now, if you need $2,000, okay, well, now we got to talk a little bit deeper right, about how yeah. we're going to make that right. happen. But twenty bucks, That's I'm petty. not gonna get my panties in a wad over twenty dollars. Not at all. We're gonna get that done and move on to dinner. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. whatever. Well, if people don't have twenty dollars for dinner either, so I guess y'all going to McDonald's <laughs> to take care of you and the kids. But I just think that also just you know goes back into being you know like how we we're saying with the role model situation. I don't necessarily feel like you know you can be a role model just about being a good person. Period. Like if it was for the kids going on a field trip, like that's something. That, like, that's something that's positive. You know what I'm saying? It's not like the kids are asking for $20 to do something illegal, to go, you know, do something mm -hmm. crazy. They're just trying to go on a field trip. So I feel like as long as you're supporting positivity, then it really shouldn't be a problem. Like, it's $20. <laughs> Again, I, I still say these are conversations you have to have. I mean, I have found myself in, in very interesting situations um, because of lack of communication. I, we don't talk enough, and especially in a... a a world now where information has taken over, we really don't talk enough. Mm -hmm. So I, I, all this stuff is practice to be able to do what you want to do in life, in my personal opinion, which, like I said, we just don't talk enough. And a lot of us don't do a good job of creating boundaries. Yes, that too. I'll raise my hand on that. I, I have <laughs> no boundaries. Just... Well, I mean, I, I guess, again, and, and the older you get, the more you, and the lessons you learn, you hopefully you're learning from them, the experiences you've had, and I'm just learning, as I get older, there's certain things I'm just not doing. And that's just what it is. And I don't, I don't know if that's how you are. I'm just, I've gotten to a place now where I'm just not doing certain things. And I have those communications with people who are entering my lives. Look, this is the line, <laughs> and you're not going to cross it. Because if you do... Cross it at your own peril. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be on an island, and I'm not going to be with you. Like, that's mm -hmm. just... And even when they enter, when I bring y'all in, I tell y'all that. This is the line, and this is where we are and are not going as it pertains to that line. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you got to have communication. Like I said, in, in, in a, a world where information is completely taken over, I was at work the other day, and these kids, like, were, it was Saturday. It was busy. And these kids, were their heads were down. They were walking. They were texting. And I was like, I'm going to see if they're going to look up before they walk into me. They never looked up. 
literally, they, it was about five of them just doing this, and they never looked up. I know you can feel the heat from me. I'm small, but I, I have a, a, a heat <laughs> rate that's your factor, so you should feel the heat from me that you're going to walk into me. They never looked up. The assumption was I was going to move. I didn't move. <laughs> I did not. I, I feel like I had to you. teach them a lesson. I'm not moving. You need to look up when you're walking. Do you I think do they that actually learned the something from that? Or well, you think they're going to do it again to well, somebody else? Well, one of them hit else. the ground. So I think really? you Really? <laughs> <laughs> I do that to men kid. all the time. Mm-hmm. One thing I realize is that when you're walking down the street, typically, like, first of all, you're supposed to be on the right side. The right side. Men will try to walk into me and expect me to move. We're going to bump into each other today, babe, because I'm not moving. <laughs> well, here's Good. a newsflash, pretty girl. They probably mean to run into you. I'm just okay, saying. Well, that's I'm, that's a newsflash. I'm bumping with some force. I don't get too close. <laughs> Put some shoulder into right. it. <laughs> They're probably meaning to walk into you. But, okay, I digress. All right, so we've done the, the immigration thing. So on the other side, something that I thought was really interesting uh, news-wise, that, okay, so... A couple of years ago, you started seeing these little uh, hand sanitizing stations popping up all over the place. It started in hospitals, and then now you see them in malls, and the assumption is, hey, if you sanitize your hands enough, you know, then you don't have to worry about bacteria and staph infections and all that good stuff, right? Not necessarily true. So there was a story on NPR that was talking about a strand of staph, uh, and I'm going to attempt to pronounce this. Uh, it's inter, inter, I should have looked this, I should have did the definition thing, but I didn't. Uh, Enterococci, a bacterium which makes up 10% of bacterial infections acquired in hospitals. Um, it's a bacteria that is usually the leading cause of sepsis, which is a deadly blood infection in North America and Europe. Um, this is a bacterium that researchers are seeing arise in. And apparently, this particular strand has become a... <coughs> uh, I don't want to say invincible to hand sanitizer, but they ended up having to go to, uh, I think, a 70% alcohol concentration to even affect it. So that myth that sanitizing your hands is all you need to do not, may not necessarily be so true. So you're saying that I need to wash my hands in gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> you need to douse yourself in, in 70% alcohol yeah, every there time there you, you go, go somewhere. There you go. That, it better be strong much. gin and tonic. <laughs> Yeah, that's well, not excuse yeah. you to drink, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, so the, that's... The, the funny thing about, um, about what, what, are, what are they? What, not a virus, but it's a bacteria. bacteria. Yeah, it's a bacteria. The funny thing about bacteria is it, it's incredibly creative. Yeah. All, all bacteria is very creative and very responsive to its environment. And so every time we come up with a solution to this, mm-hmm. they come up with another trick. And so we're, we're, it's constantly doing this you know, thing where we're, we're by fighting it and it's fighting us. And I, do, I don't know, eventually we'll come up with another solution which will be outdated you know, two or three years later because the bacteria is creative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and apparently uh, this bacteria is surviving for longer periods of time even after being doused in alcohol. So that, that's, I read it was like, whoa. Because, you know, again, a lot of times we're, we operate off the information we're fed. So if you tell me that I need to sanitize my hands two and three times a day when I touch doorknobs or when I walk into the mall, I'm going to do that. So, and, I, and I think I'm good. So when you tell me that, okay, yeah, the sanitizer that you're using, that we told you to use, might not be strong enough, I'm kind of concerned. Mm-hmm. That, that oh, makes me concerned. Sanitizer. This is just one more reason for me not to have children. Oh, good. <laughs> Are you going to use everything to, to yes. combat the fact that you don't want kids? Yeah. You do realize I could change them all, they're right? already Because they're already so dirty. Imagine, like, them getting an actual infection. What would I, What do you do with that? No. Well, having raised well, the, two the of them. The beauty of the kids is that because they are getting dirty and they're eating dirt and they're, they are immune to a lot of infections because their body builds. I think one of the reasons that we're so screwed up is that we have tried to protect ourselves mm-hmm. from all of these bugs, and consequently now our body is not prepared to deal with it. And so yeah. that when it happens, that particular person is really just out of out of sorts with this stuff. I was thinking about that the other day. Like our bodies must be like think of all the germs our bodies must be immune to mm-hmm. because the world is such a dirty place. Like we have to just even working at working at a bar. That's really what made me think about it. So many yeah, people like throw. touch things and are, you and know, throw all over up the on place. the bar. Yeah, and, and are yeah. like, you know, just constantly drinking out of these same glasses and like, it's, ooh, mm-mm. And yet we survive. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I've been, uh, 
72 much. years old, and imagine all the germs I have survived for 72 years. <laughs> well, that's my theory on bacon. It's like, well, you should be eating bacon. Well, my grandma was 92, and she ate bacon religiously. So try again, because mm-hmm. I love bacon. I once had an older black man who grew up in the South tried to tell me that pork was what was going to save us. And that <laughs> bacon is not our problem, but that the salt is. And that if you just dry it out enough, you're good to go. I mean, look at it this way. Today they'll tell you that you should be eating kale. Tomorrow they'll tell you that the bugs that pee on kale have made kale something you should not be eating. They yeah. do this kind of stuff all the time. Yeah, that's so true. I don't hear those kind of studies about bacon. My theory is this. One day, and I've done research on this, 100% of all of us are going to die. <laughs> wow. Well, hey, everybody's dying. I didn't know that. So between this here is shocking. and there, <laughs> eat I didn't know the that. bacon. Eat mm-hmm. dessert Eat first because life is very uncertain. Literally, especially do, now. Do what gives you pleasure. Do what makes you happy. Do what makes your eyes light up. And then on the day you die, you're lying there going, I had a really good run. This was fun. Now I'm probably going to play the devil's advocate there. Because I know a lot of people want to eat good food. It tastes good, right? Bacon tastes good. Ice cream tastes good. It all tastes great. But see, the thing is, as you get older and start getting medical problems associated with those things, then the things that you want to do, such as rock climbing, such as traveling, you're not necessarily (laughs) able to do. Not saying you, specifically. (laughs) Well, you know. I think people who want to go out rock climbing deserve anything that happens to them. (laughs) What if they got a harness that's going to save them? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> save that them. Save was, them just like that the kale. Harness was built by people who, <laughs> that's all who I'm got saying. the lowest that's all I'm saying. Yeah, but all I'm saying is eating healthy not necessarily is going to be the answer, but some people do it in order to be healthier in other aspects of their life, to be able to do more active things. I admire things. them. Yeah. I admire them too because I can't do it. I don't want to be them, but I admire them. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> I'm, about to say, I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm pretty sure Jordan is on the mm-hmm. the. Aren't you a a fit type person? A fit type person? Yeah, like gym, good heat. Yeah, I'm, I've actually been vegan for two months. So oh, really? That has actually there, been there extremely difficult. There Let's is, talk but, about yeah. that. There All is. right, here we that, go. <laughs> what was that like? No, really, because I'm. Not, I mean, I'm not a big meat or dairy person anyway like I, I don't do I am. milk I, I am I, really oh. the only dairy I I'm like I need to really with cheese. <laughs> okay <laughs> see and I'm not even like I, I probably only eat meat maybe like one or two meals in a day and even that I try Why to like keep it minimum have to, Morgan always has to be the anomaly in anything we talk about like I don't how does that happen because I am intelligent and I read and I know there that these things are not the way they're supposed to be honey there's <laughs> the answer fine I will give you that mm-hmm. I think you read too much I'm sorry that you read too much never 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 no such you know what I was thinking about the other day? Oh, God. I think school really made me hate real. Like, I just, I had to go to Barnes and Noble the other day and just buy books because it was freaking me out. I feel like I don't know enough words anymore. Like, I feel like I'm getting dumber. Like, you, I went to school. I'm serious. I went to school. They made me hate books. I hated reading. I wasn't reading for pleasure, like leisure, just to, like, learn things that I was interested about. And was like over it and they were expensive like who was going I spent like $80 at Barnes and Noble other day. who was doing it in college not me I didn't even have $80 for groceries well, $80 but, textbooks today are way, way more, more than $80 I'm not even thinking about textbooks Ooh. I'm glad I'm done with that portion Simply. of my life please <laughs> say it one more time that, that crap right there is ridiculous but yes mm. reading is fundamental <laughs> and a lot of times the professor writes the book and you take that professor's class, and they say, oh, you got to buy my book, $250. Which yes. is crazy. Okay, well, I'm not even going to lie, because when yes. I finish my doctorate, that is where I'm going. Like, I want to write a book and be like, okay, so in order to take my class, which everybody's going to want to do, because I'm going to be the cool professor, <laughs> you're going to have to buy calculated conflict to be able to take my class. Well, at least make sure there's no typos in it, because I had a professor who had a oh, book man. that had typos in it. I was like, be nerve of you. You know how much money I spent on this? <laughs> How is that possible? Because most of them have to go through like yeah. McPherson and, yeah. and all those. Oh, and it didn't, like, literally, he would give us bonus points on the test. If you went through the book and you found a typo and you oh, let him know about it, you got bonus book. points okay. on the exam. Yes, so it was he like a personal him book. and he another. Was you it edit was for his a. Book. Yes, it was for a. Mar- <laughs> yes, it was for a marketing right. class. Him and another professor wrote the book together, and if you found typos in it, you could get bonus points. Well, that was intentional. If he made you find the typos in it, that was intentional. Child, no. Intentional to get that $150 out of me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you spent $100. I'm behind the curve. I need to be behind <laughs> You need a bigger book. I, a bigger I, book. I need a thicker and bigger book to try to get, you know, what I need done. Ricardo, when I take your class, 
I'm gonna get once they leak that free PDF of your book. That's what I'm going. Oh my for. god, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's the trick. Are we still doing that? <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, definitely. Well, that's all right. I mean, a hundred fifty dollar book. Even if you only spend twenty five to get a used one, I'm good. Cause my book only costs fifteen dollars now, and when I become a professor, it's going to one hundred and fifty. So you won't get away mm-hmm. with less than at least seventy five. I'm good with that. I'm okay. Absolutely good Fair with enough. That. So I'm, I'm just you know I'm absolutely good with that. All right, so we have about two minutes before we go to a break. So the other thing that I was looking at when we were talking about uh, DACA and people going back overseas, I ran across an article in NPR, uh, which was talking about there's a new housing crisis. Because remember, the old one was the housing market crashed, and people lost all their money, and they lost their homes. Well, now the problem is people being shut out of the market. So what does that mean? Well, apparently there's more people wanting to buy a home than there are actually homes available to be brought. So people are being outbid on homes. Um, People are not being able to find homes. Um, So what is the bigger problem? Well, apparently the bigger problem is they're not building enough homes because there's a labor shortage. So that labor shortage can be accredited to what we were talking about, uh, people who typically would do those kinds of jobs, a lot of times which are the immigrants doing the foundation building, all that uh, basic stuff. They're no longer here to do those jobs. Number two is people are not going to trade schools like they used to, to get degrees in welding or electricians. They're not going to school for that stuff anymore. So now they can't build houses fast enough. Mm -hmm. So what's happening is you decide, which we had that conversation the other day when Brent and Christina was here, Mm -hmm. you decide you want to go buy a house. Get everything in, in the paperwork squared away. You find the house you love. They put a bid on it. You don't get the bid. Somebody outbids you. And apparently cash is becoming a big thing. So people are actually paying cash for homes. So people are being outbid by cash, uh, people with cash money. So what are we thinking? I want that kind of cash. You I know. I'm like, I'm like, who has like $20,000 just in laying cash, around yeah. to oh, yeah. buy a house? Not in the regular people, but. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, it's Morgan's friends because they Literally, understood, no. they under, <laughs> they understood I'm money. You, it's so, so important. They all the reading. It's so important. <laughs> one, that's another thing. One that I've been like hanging out with like older people just to like because they know more about money and things they've been through more and they're the type of people who will have twenty thousand dollars laying around and i'm making sure to get close to them because i need twenty thousand dollars of my own you feel me i'm trying to learn how to be just like that (laughs) i need i want a house one day i don't want to like live with the fear that one day i won't be able to afford one or that because all that stuff is it's kind of intimidating when you think about it and then on top of getting once you get past all of that like you said, you get all your paperwork done. Now it showed up. I've fallen in love with this house. Yeah. And somebody else came and slept mm-hmm. it. Like, I can't. I would not. Mm-mm. See, this one for um, Brett and Christina. What's the five rules for buying <laughs> yeah. a house? You know I don't Ooh, remember. What, what are the five rules <laughs> oh, for I buying a house? I'd like yeah. to know. You need. You got to know an idea of your credit store. Yeah, and score. you need an idea of your credit you score. Uh-huh. Check stubs and, like, bank statements. Uh-huh. You need your ID. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's one other thing. All right, Terry. Look, y'all, I, <laughs> how you gonna bring it up and can't even remember it? My eyes well, you know we won't. We'll be Morgan. renting. Don't even worry. We'll be renting for a while. Don't even worry about it. Oh yes, yes, yes. I think that's one of the things. This labor shortage must must be pretty extreme because a lot of people our age are looking to rent for the long term future. Maybe yeah. not until they're 30 years old, looking to buy a house. And if there's already a shortage, yeah, that must mean that that's a really Really big issue. Well, I mean, the issue because how do you get? It's everything. All of this is funny to me because in our well, I can't say our because I'm, no, I'm used to Chris sitting there. We're a little close in age. We're not. Um, <laughs> but in in thanks the, for noticing. <laughs> <laughs> in the older days, you know, they were telling us to do certain things, and then we stopped doing them. So now we're having to go back to doing those things because in my day, there was always a push to go to a technical college. It's cheaper, you know, you can get you an associate's degree and then you can transfer to a four-year school. Now you don't hear that stuff anymore. I don't even see those kinds of commercials anymore. Mm -hmm. Because you used to see those commercials Mm -hmm. from Everest and all them. Hey, I went to school for welding. You know, I went to school to be an electrician. You're not seeing that anymore. So I don't think people are conscious that, hey, you can go to a two-year school, get a trade, and make a lot of money being an electrician. So again, how do we get back to that place? And there's a lot of stability with those jobs too that a lot of people including myself a while ago, didn't realize there's always that push for my generation to get good grades in high school so that you can go to college, a good school, go to graduate school, and all that stuff. And it's it's marketed as the only way. Mm-hmm. Like, you have to go to a good school or else you're going to be completely screwed the rest of your life. But why – I go back to the same question I was asking in our first block. Why do we do that? Why? Who's behind the messaging – 
that you've got to get good grades in high school so that you can go to college and graduate school. What is the, what, who benefits other than me from me going to college? Universities and government. Everybody, That's just the culture. Yeah, it's yeah. all about money. It's yep. like, and you're supposed and the, to support and, and the government, because now in order for me to go to school, I have to take out those loans. And mm, now yeah. in order for me to take out those loans, I have to pay those loans back. But, mm. but, but I didn't know that when I was going to college. I didn't think about this until fairly recently when it dawned on me that I am the product that Facebook sells. Ooh. I'm the product. Explain. Well, <laughs> all of my data and your data, without us, Facebook does not exist. Right. Because there's nothing to sell. There's nothing they can monetize. But without us, universities have nothing to monetize. Mm -hmm. This is, Ultimately, it boils down to Who's going to make the rules? It's always going to be made by the guy with the rule, the gold, because the guy with the gold makes the rules. And as a 72-year-old man looking back on his life, I will tell you this. If I had my life to do over again, I would not walk through the door of a university. I've, I'm I've, actually going to agree with that because I looked at my student loan debt from me trying to finish a doctorate. I was like, what was I thinking? Like, yeah. a lot of the stuff that I've done – I didn't need a degree for her. Yeah. Like even doing this, I did you not did major not in broadcasting. Yeah. I didn't do any of that. I mean, I'm appreciative of them because I still use them, but I could have gone a completely different route and still got the same results. I totally so I agree. absolutely agree with that. And, and, I, and then you look at the amount of debt you've got and you got to say, well, what kind of job would I have to literally. have to make that go away in yeah. my mm -hmm. lifetime? Yeah, it's like not I'm, an entry level the position. The math doesn't work. I did go to school for broadcast journalism and I was – truly grateful for my experience. I feel like I learned a lot and learned from some of the best. Do, do I feel like it was worth $120,000 in loans? No, ma'am. Mm -hmm. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma no, ma no, ma no term. That's how high yours are already? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I'm, I don't, oh, I'm about to no. say, good God. But yours is out of state, too. Though. Right. So, like, eventually, mm -hmm. my, my staffer loans are, like, 40000 and I had, like, a parent plus loan. So, if, if I'll end up paying it back, but it's really under my parents' name and their credit. But still, like, yes, to in total, yeah, it's probably, like, 120000 Jesus, for a bachelor's. Mm-hmm. All right, because, um, <laughs> on that note, we're going to take our second break. And when we come back, we're going to talk to our guests and let them expound upon networking and motivation. So stick around the Leadership Blend with your host, Ricardo D. Rice. You're listening to IBNX. IBNXradio.com. The station with the best, 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 best music. Best music. I love the music. I love the music. Best music. Best music. <laughs> Hey, what's up? It's Jay-Z. Hey, I'm Mariah Carey. Hey, it's Katy Perry. It's your boy, T.I.P., man. Get in. It's your boy, Sean Kingston. What's up, y'all? I'm Beyonce. This is Nicki Minaj, and I'm in the mix with IBNX Radio. You may think that it's over, that your life is done. The oh, man. is to come. Don't sweat the challenge. Your battle's already won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, y'all. See, God writes the end before the story began. Oh, he told me to tell you the best. As the author of your faith, he wrote a provision for you to win. You're a no winner. Man. You're a winner. Be You're a winner. My brother, my brother, my brother. 
just is on the way. I see you, eagle. I see you flying high. Ooh, you ain't seen nothing. You ain't seen nothing. You ain't seen nothing. I know you may think that you have. But God told me to tell you. You got to keep on fighting. Keep on praying. Say that you're wonderful, but it doesn't seem good enough. I can say that you're kind, but that would miss the mark. I can say that you're beautiful, but to me you are so much more. How do I communicate exactly? trying to convey the sentiment of my heart and say I really do appreciate the way you brighten up my day. I can't find down the line and name all the things that captivate my heart but clearly I'm not aware of words that can compare how do I communicate exactly who you are I'm trying to Say, I really do appreciate the 
All right, buddy. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Leadership Blend with your host, Ricardo D. Rice, and correspondents. Terry Michelle. And Morgan Buckle. Jordan and Rubin. And Keith Ivy. All right, so we have a full house. All right, so the purpose of today's show is to talk about proper networking. Well, what does that mean? Well, we have a guy today who is 70 plus. Is it 70 plus? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, plus. and proud. Because he's already said he's proud of him. We are, too. We're so happy to have mm-hmm. him. He's, that he's still walking the face of earth, even though he was with Jesus. We know we were just, we were just excited about it. Oh, my but God. <laughs> As I said he to said Noah one time. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have, uh, I call him networking guru, uh, Mr. Keith Ivey. So he's going to talk about when you go out and how do you properly sell yourself? And what should you do when you're in the room with, with professionals and executives? What do I do? Because I know a lot of people that freeze up or they don't really understand the dynamics of networking. So that's what we're going to learn today. We're going to learn networking etiquette with Mr. Keith Ivey. So take it away, sir. My experience in networking probably is a good place to start because I, can't, I worked on cruise ships for two years, as you probably well know. And during two years at sea, when I came off of ships, the world had passed me by. Mm. I, you know, like two years without television was a fantastic experience. <laughs> and so I need to have a job. I need to make money. And so I, I said, I'm going to, okay, I decided what I'm going to do. And so well, how am I going to do that? So well, you go to networking events. What's a networking event? Well, there's this thing called meetup and, and uh, Eventbrite. You know, so you, you go and you, so, okay, I went. And I walked in and said, well, this is sort of like a cocktail party. Why, and nothing, uh, nothing good came from it. And I met this guy who had made $100,000 in my business in one year. And I said to him, what did you do to make $100,000? He said, well, it was pretty easy. I made 50 cold calls every day. To which I said, I don't want $100,000 that day. <laughs> <laughs> so I better learn how to do networking or I'm going to starve because I'm not making phone calls like that. So I started going to networking events and watching. I became a student of the event. I watched the event. I didn't go there for any other reason except to figure out what the mechanics were of that event. How does this thing, this drama, play out? What are the acts that are in the drama? And so I learned a great deal about that, and I I took it and adopted it. I taught myself how to network and immediately started making money. I said, this is brilliant you are so good at this and uh, that's when I started you know my business coach said at the the time said you need to go start teaching this because people need to learn this so I developed a workshop called connect like a pro but the first thing I realized was that I had to go to the right networking event Atlanta is probably one of the best networking cities in the world absolutely yeah and you can go you can go eat a meal breakfast lunch and dinner Monday through Friday somewhere if you're okay with beer and chicken wings. Which we yeah. know is your favorite food, uh, I can live with that. That's <laughs> okay favorite with food. But the fact that we've got so many makes it very difficult to know what to do because there's only a limited amount of time and money and energy that any of us have. So I said, okay, the first thing I have to do is figure out where do I need to go? Where, where, what are the vital networking events that are on the calendar? So once I figured that out, I said, okay, that's good. Okay, and now I know where I'm going. Uh, but I don't know what to do when I get there. I don't know how to behave there. I don't know how to prepare for it. And so I taught myself this little trick. I went in early. I always go to a networking event early. And so if this were a networking event, and, and, and there's only four or five of us here, I get here along with y'all, and I'm going to stand right over here near the door because now I'm going to greet people when they come in. And they think it's my event. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to buy the venue. I didn't have to do anything except, except show up and be in the right place at the right time. And so now I'm meeting everybody that comes in. And now I said, oh, you know, I know somebody you need to meet. You need to, I, y'all, come here. And I start introducing y'all. And all of a sudden, you're thinking, he knows everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because I met everybody coming in. Yeah. <laughs> and so now I am, I've created value in the room by greeting people, being nice to people, smiling to people, and then a few of them, I'm connecting them. And then the next thing I learned was, and this is really important to me anyway, I'm 
may not be important to anybody else, but it is to me. People say, well, what do you do? They always say, what do you do? Well, the answer is, well, if you're a CPA, I'm a CPA. <laughs> or if you're an attorney, I'm an attorney. Or I'm a, a talk show uh, MC. Like, is that really what you do? Well, it's, how, it's, it's the mechanics of what you do. But I learned for myself that what I do in my business is I help small business owners sleep better at night. Now, if I tell you that, all you know is he either does something with small business owners or he sells mattresses. Right? <laughs> <laughs> or, or drugs. Or yeah. drugs. <laughs> what, what exactly? But it causes you to say, really? How do you do that? And that's the reaction I want. If I say to you, oh, I'm an attorney, your reaction is, ugh, big deal, because mm -hmm. I know plenty of attorneys. But if I were to say to you, I help people who are in trouble get out of trouble, really? How do you do that? And that's the reaction I'm always going for. If people don't respond with that, I figure what I said was wrong. It just it didn't work, because it's got to generate the, oh, what do? how do you do that? And my reaction to that is, well, I do it really, really well. <laughs> and then I say, what do you do? Because I want, now we're talking, they're talking. And I learn about them and I say, that's really interesting. How long have you been in business? How did you get into that? What, what made you want to do that versus all the other things you could do? And now they're thinking, I'm the best talker in the world because I'm not talking, I'm just listening to them. Mm -hmm. And I have learned in the length of time, maybe we're with them for two minutes, I've learned that they're in this type of business, they have this kind of market, they, uh, they've been in this business this length of time, and they are a sole practitioner of their business. And I say, they are a good prospect for me. And then I say, I'd like to learn more about your business. Can we get together and let me learn more about your business so that I might be able to be a good referral source? Well, sure. So I leave that, build, that building that night with three or four appointments. And because I qualified them really well, I'm seeing the right people. And I know that my close ratio is 90%. So when I go home that night, I know that I, I, I've got three appointments and two and a half of them are going to become clients. And if I do that three nights a week, I will meet my target numbers at the end of the month. So it made, networking became tons of fun because I had this complete strategy for what to do when I got there. I even knew how to, like if we're talking and you know I'm really liking you, you're liking me, and, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, this is really going on too long. Say, I'd love to learn more about you. And I'm, we're going to see you on Thursday, but I, we've got people to go see. So I had to learn how to get away from people mm -hmm. so that they did not, you know, there, there's always somebody in the network group who's, they haven't talked to a human being, uh, an adult. <laughs> and, and, and very often it's a woman who's got kids at home and she mm. hasn't had an adult conversation yeah. in so long. She just sort of latches onto you. Oh, I, yeah, you're leaving me now. <laughs> <laughs> Until the cows come home. And you have to figure out how to get away in a polite and professional manner. But that, to me, networking is all about doing the right thing at the right time. And it's not complicated. But it's not easy either. Networking is the most difficult way to generate revenue on the planet. Other than cold calls. Cold calls it got that and walking in cold door to door. You know, anybody who can, anybody who's willing to go door to door and make sales, my hat's off to you because they ain't. That's like rock climbing to me. I ain't gonna go. Do that. <laughs> um, but uh, if you learn how to network effectively, so that you and, and Corey Moore, you've you've talked to you know Corey, yeah. Corey Moore, the king of networking in Atlanta. He says I am, and I say no, 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 no. I bow down to Corey. Corey will go to three networking events in a night. Oh, God, no. I mean, the man <laughs> is just, uh, he, he's got to have more money spent on gas <laughs> than anybody I know. But, you know, he has a strategy for what he's going to do, and he'll go home by 10 o'clock at night, and he will have accomplished his objectives. That's the key to networking, knowing what you want to accomplish, having a strategy for accomplishing it, and then going out and being willing to do it. So would you advise that people take or uh, go to three or four a week? I mean, how, how would you strategize? I, 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 to me, it's, it's math. See, I start out by looking at how much money do I want to make per year. 
I divide that by 10 because I only want to work 10 months a year. So now I know how much money I have to make per month. And then I divide that number by the average cost of a transaction. So now I know how many transactions I've got to have. Right. Then I divide that number by three because I'm going to get three appointments per networking event. And eventually those that math formula will tell me how many networking events I have to go to per month gotcha. or per week. Now, how can that translate to the average person? Like a person like myself, I could totally benefit from networking events. I need a job. I need plenty of jobs. I just graduated from school. You know what I'm saying? Like, what would I do? How would I start? Where would I go? I think you would have to start looking at the people that you want to have you to hire you. Who do you want to say yes to you? Okay. Or maybe even better than that, who could you talk to that would be able to help you get better at interviewing? Right. Who, who can be helpful to you about the industry you'd like to be in? Maybe they're not going to ever hire you, but they know the industry you want to be in, and they can give you information, and gotcha. they'll make you sharper. So you go to, then you have to say, okay, these people, this, these are the people I want to talk to. Where do they go to network? Very often, they don't go to meetups. Right. They go to... Yeah. Because anytime I hear about networking events, it always seems just like it's something for... People to go dress up for, take pictures, and then come home and say, "Oh, I went to a networking event," and it just never seemed beneficial to me. Yeah, you have to be careful, cause especially in a city like this, where with media in particular, mm -hmm. because that's what you will find. You'll yes. go to a room full of uh, media people, and they're just trying to run the room and take pictures with important people to right. say, "I've been there." Yeah, uh, yeah. I had an intern like that. I was like, "Sweetie." She's like, well, yeah, I took all these pictures. Yeah, but did you really accomplish anything? You yeah. took pictures with people. Like, what was? What did you accomplish? Are they what? hiring? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did they, did they give you an opportunity? Like, what, what is the, you know, so I mean, outside of meetup, what else would you suggest? A meetup? Event, I think right? when I go to networking events, I've, I've got two things I do in business. I, I, I'm a consultant for small businesses, but I also teach networking. Those two functions are radically different. So when I'm talking about I'd like to meet people who need to learn about networking. The best place to go is any networking event. Because if, if you put 100 people in a room, 85, 90% of them will have no clue what they're doing. This is true. They are my market for my workshop. So I can go to any networking event. I don't have to be very picky about that. Now, when I'm talking about working with small business owners, where do small business owners go? They go to business associations. That's why I go to the Marietta mm -hmm. Business Association luncheon and the Marietta Business Association networking event over at uh, Andretti's Andretti. on Thursdays. Every Thursday at 3 o'clock at Andretti's in Marietta. <laughs> Preceding was a paid political announcement. Um, <laughs> Which I will say, FYI, most of the guests that have been here this month, that's where they come from because we attended. Actually, when I came in, Keith was in charge when I first got there. Mm -hmm. He was the, I'll say, moderator of the group when I first got there. And then he stepped down, what, Three, four weeks after I got there? It was something else. It was like three or four weeks after I got there. It was something you said, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> when I, I mean, when you meet Keith, and this is why I would let him talk about networking, because when you walk into a room with Keith, he commands the room. So when I got in, my strategy was like, okay, who am I? I got to take down the biggest person in the room. I've got to talk to them. And it, was, it took less than five minutes to go, it's him. He's the one, because everybody was coming to Keith, even if he didn't know me. Like he said, he's at the door greeting them. And even now he's not in charge, but he's still that guy. When he walks in, everybody's like, there goes Keith. And everybody wants to talk to him. So that's why I had to have him talk about it. And I appreciate hearing that. And honestly, it was not a strategy. It was an accident. Really? Yes. It was my brand as a good networker was an accident. It was a happy accident. But at some point, it, the light went on and said, wow, everybody knows me. Mm-hmm. I don't know everybody, but everybody knows me. What does that mean? And so I had to uh, to uh, figure that out. And so now I am, I go to networking events and everybody in the room knows me. And it's a little embarrassing at times because I don't know them. Right. <laughs> so you have to figure out how to, to relate to people who know you like a brother and yeah. you've never seen them before in your life. But yes, you have, you know, because at 72, you start thinking, you start forgetting things. <laughs> but. Um, I would, I would start going to networking events um, where the employers that you would like to meet go. 
and say to them, I know you're probably not ever going to hire me, but you know things I want to know. Absolutely. The best way to introduce yourself to a brand new person, you never. this is for people who are really shy and they hate walking into a group where they don't know people. That's me, so I'm ready to okay, here's, here's this. You try this and you let me know how this works. Okay. You walk into a room, you stop. Well, first of all, get there early so that you're there before they do. Okay. And people come in. You say hello to them. And then you walk up, pick up the, the two or three people that are the most interesting looking, and they're talking to each other. You walk over to them and interrupt them and say, you people look like people I ought to know. You can do that. I can see you doing that. You can do that. Okay. You the look like people powerful, I ought to know. The most powerful thing you can say to people is you look like somebody I ought to know. It's just, well, you're validating the fact that they're on the earth and that they are valuable and they're important. And, and the sexiest thing ever a woman, a woman ever said to me, she walks up to me in a networking event. She says, you know what? I think you should ask me out. <laughs> oh, okay. that sounds like Morgan. I, that <laughs> sounds exactly oh, like Morgan. Powerful. Because <laughs> as soon as someone says something to validate you, mm -hmm. you are, they've got you. you yeah. know, that's better than, than, than Hot Foot Sunday. They've got you. Honey, and so be the one who gets them when you say to them, you look like somebody I ought to know. So I think the part that a lot of people get wrong in networking is you may go to the event, you you know, you do the work, you talk to the people, but how do you follow up on that? What do you do when you leave? I think that's more like that's also really important. What would you say? Well, I collect a lot of business cards at a networking event. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I do when I get out of a networking event is I separate those cards into stacks. And I'm in the parking lot. So I say, okay, these are people that I want to stay in touch with. Mm -hmm. These are people who they will never be valuable to me in terms of business, but they're interesting people. Mm -hmm. And these are people who might be valuable to my clients. Okay. And so... If I've got 10 people that I want to stay in touch with, I will, if they've got mobile numbers on their cards, I will sit in the parking lot and send them a text before I leave the parking lot. Hmm. See, I would always, well, I would think email. You think no, text because is better. Tech, because they're still in the room. Right. And so the first thing, the first person on the planet that they hear from at that event is me. The first that and the last, seems like. Yeah, as and soon so, as you walk in the door, as soon as yeah. he walks out. Yeah, okay. <laughs> And then I, and I put all those cards in a baggie and put the name of the event on the baggie okay. so that I don't have just cards flying all over the place. Gotcha. So then I can throw them on my desk, and tomorrow morning I'm going to take pictures of those cards, put them into my CRM, and, and follow-up is hard. You, I, I figure for every hour that I go to a networking event, I have got to allocate an hour of follow-up. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have the time to follow-up, I don't have the time to go. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Honey, coming through with the gems today. Mm -hmm. I, I, look, he's y'all to know by now. The people that are coming through this month, they, they are some experts in their fields. I, I, I've spent some time with them, so they're pretty good at what they do. Terry, I know you got questions. Um, so like, I know that you you said that this happened like on an accident, but you you're happy for the accident. Mm -hmm. Like, is there any type of really like certifications or anything that you really need to have to kind of like be an expert in this kind of field? No, the the, the it's. The way you become an expert is over time okay. and experience. Now you, you can take, you can come to my workshop and you'll be better. You can go to other classes and you'll be better. You can study, but the, the key to getting better is to take what you learn and then go out and use it. And one of the things I do in my workshop is I, I take, let's say you do my, my workshops three hours long. Anybody who's interested, I will take them networking to an okay. event. And we, we will contract to go to three networking events over the next month. And they go, I take them with me. And then they go out and they do what I taught them. And then they come back and say, okay, I did it. What, and I watch them. So I, I say, okay, instead of walking over to the set, do this. Try to, so I'm constantly coaching them on how to get better that night. So just get it, just practice. So how many, like, networking events can you say, like, if you had to do an estimate? Like, how many networking events have you been to? Ugh. Oh, I'd have to do the math. Honey, I in this know. lifetime? No, but I, say, well, not, hey. I don't want to say like in this lifetime, but I'm saying like before you feel like you just got to that point where you were comfortable, like, okay, I can coach everybody in the room if I wanted to. Like, when did you get there? It took me 
three months after I broke the the process down and put it into I, I'm a by training and by design I am a theatrical producer okay. and all producers know is they've got a big Rolodex they've got contacts and they know process mm -hmm. that's all we know and so I had to take networking and break it down to process what is the what are the steps you go through so once I did that then I went out and practiced it and fine-tuned it so it took me three months of doing three or four a week before I could go this is working and when it started working was how I knew it started working was people were giving me money and to me that's how I evaluate the effectiveness of mine at a networking event are people paying me money that's how I keep score and I believe networking should be profitable if, if, if it should Absolutely. be fun and profitable if it's one or the other you're missing out on something pretty significant okay. anybody else I'm speechless honey. I'm shook all I can think about <laughs> is what I need to be doing now <laughs> exactly I'm focusing on my goals and dreams like okay this is what you need to do what you need to say. And this Jordan, you supposed to be the motivation. Say, this is where Jordan comes mm -hmm. in. Now right. this is where I come oh, trust me, he's next. <laughs> All right, so we're going to shift to Jordan because he's a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. So you get to give the thoughts. You can talk about yourself and give us the thought for today. You get to be the motivation for the today. The thought for the day. Yeah, you All get right. to be, the, based on what we've talked about, you get to be the motivation and, and the thought for today. All right, well, I'd like to start out by saying if you want some other motivation outside of this video, you can check out Eclipse Motivation on YouTube. I posted a video this morning, definitely check it out. I post every single Monday morning. But how did I get started with that? So we'll go into that. But I would say it was in college when I didn't really have any unique experiences that anybody else doesn't have in high school. And I was just like a normal kid, you know, I got good grades, I followed the system we talked about earlier, and I got into UGA. And when I was at UGA, I really didn't have any goals after that. Like it started out, it started out like high school, my big goal was to get into a good school. That was the, the thing that my parents pushed me to do, and I thank them for that. Thank you, mom and dad, <laughs> but <laughs> if you're listening. But then once I went to college, I started realizing, wait, I did all this hard work, and now what do I want? Mm. Like, I'm going into this major. I was declared pre-pharmacy just because it sounded like, oh, I, d I took science classes, so sure, why not? Let's give that a shot. And then I took a, a science class at UGA, and it did not end well. <laughs> I, <laughs> I had to drop biology 1107, it, Jesus. and it was an early morning class, so freshman in college, early morning class. We all know that doesn't Big work mistake. out. Yeah, exactly. That, 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 Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Let's Never not even get into that. Let's not even get into that. Huge. Never, never ends well. Oh, yeah. Did not do it again, <laughs> at least during my freshman year. But so I dropped that class and started really thinking, okay, what do I want to do with my life? And then I talked to my dad. I talked, and he's a CPA. He worked in accounting. He's like, why don't you give it a shot? So I switched over to the accounting major Ended up doing well in that. I actually did enjoy it, which is why I work at an accounting firm to this day. But where did the motivational speaking come in? So I would say that was around my sophomore year of college. So during my freshman and sophomore year, I would say my attitude was pretty bare minimum. Even though I was working to be an accountant, working to graduate and get that degree, I knew what I wanted to do, but it was more just do what I need to do. Go get the grades get at least an A or a B, move on to the next. And, and that was it. I didn't really have any motivation to go out and meet some, some people at different firms or go out and network or get involved. I really did not do that. I had a very bare minimum attitude and I got into a lot of drinking and drugs, all that stuff. And one, that big wake up call that I had, I would say was my, my sophomore year, early sophomore year when I, I was drinking in a hot tub and I passed out in said hot tub. And it was probably about a couple hours or so, and I somehow did not drown and survived the whole experience. It was pretty terrifying, to say the least. I but just saw an episode of that on The Closer. The you did? Show. Yeah. That, that was, was me, me, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little older, no. but yeah, it could have been you. It could have been. I mean. Wow. But I think the only reasons that I survived was, first of all, it was like 30 degrees outside, and it was an outdoor hot tub. The hot tub wasn't at its full temperature, 
and I had my arms out to the side, which prevented me from falling in and drowning. Jesus. Now, if I were to do that again, chances of me surviving are pretty slim. Yeah. Regardless, that whole experience got me thinking, okay, now I need to find, like, if I had died that day, what, am I, what would my legacy have been? And I started thinking, wow, I've really just had a, like, a get-by attitude, a very bare minimum attitude. And I got to start thinking, what do I want to do? So I started by saying, okay, I, sh I could start studying more. I could start trying a little more. I could start getting back in shape. And I started doing all those things, but still, still sort of question myself, what do I want to do? What is my big impact that I want to make on the world? And ironically, the way I was getting through that period of time was by listening to a motivational speaker on YouTube. So I listened to a motivational speaker on YouTube and think, huh, all right, what do I want to do? What, what, what's my calling? Now, nah, nothing. So I listened to another motivational speaker and think, huh, all right, how is this helping me? What do I want to do? And after doing that a couple times, I said, you know what? I could be a motivational speaker. I could do that. I could have my own channel and inspire other people. So I didn't do it at that moment. I thought this is something I could do eventually. Not right now, because right now I'm still in school. Right now I'm focusing on my classes. I don't have the time for it and probably don't have the life experience for it. But, but what happened was, I guess my, my junior year passed and everything. And that summer I went to this leadership conference, or not a conference, it was a summer camp for high school kids. And I was an RA, so I was leading the high school kids with a group of other people. And one of the other guys happened to be a motivational speaker on the side. Like he had his own job, but he also got paid to be a motivational speaker. Oh. And that was like the first time I spoke up and said, you know, I've thought about that. That's something I'm interested in doing. And, and he was like, oh, why don't you give a speech to all the high schoolers this Friday? And I was like, <laughs> there's like 100 kids here. What are you? <laughs> I've never done this before. And I was like, well, those were the things I was thinking in my head. But out loud, I said, yeah, sure. That, that sounds great. Let's do it. And it ended up being, I guess, an, from what I've heard, an OK speech. The high school kids got something out of it. They learned During that program, they learned about accounting. They learned about business at the University of Georgia. And, and they liked my speech. Apparently, I did a decent job. <laughs> Somebody, that's what I heard. I was, but, somebody tell you it was decent? <laughs> that, that, that's based on my assumption and other people oh, okay. saying it was good. But anyway, so that's how that happens. And because of that experience, I would say I finally said, you know what? I'm not going to start this whole YouTube thing in September. I'm not going to start it next year. I'm going to start it right now. And ever since then, I've just I've had the YouTube channel. I ended up starting a podcast, and I've just been giving motivational talks. I also joined Toastmasters. Excellent, excellent group. I'd recommend that to anybody. What is that? Toastmasters. Oh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so Toastmasters is a, essentially a group where people get together, and every single one of them is looking to improve their public speaking. It's a public speaking. Exactly. Okay. Like oh, someone could be extremely <laughs> terrified of never public heard of speaking. No, no. Actually, wait, because mm -hmm. you have. Are you still with Brent and them at the mm -hmm. one they do? Yeah. Because he's. Are y'all in charge, or are they all a part of it? I I was the president last year. And and we've got a new, you know, we just started a new set of officers. But yeah, the okay. Toastmasters is incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you get into that? You find the you local sign up. Um, actually, so I'm the president. I just recently got elected the president of the Knowledge Club over in Marietta. Are you nearby that area? No. No. no? Well, then there's definitely a club nearby you. You honestly go to Toastmasters.org. Say which club is closest to me, and then it'll, yeah, you'll a, find the one closest. Isn't there a fee to you. for that? There is oh, a fee. It's a it's, whopping ninety bucks a year. Yeah, no, it's it definitely it, 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 worth it. Just kill you. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like some some some. So some, what do you like as a motivational speaker? What keeps you motivated? What makes you want to get up and like even do this in the first place? Honestly, just thinking about how I grew up being. I was pretty shy growing up, and I wasn't that big of a speaker or anything. I wouldn't speak up. I, there's no way I'd go on a radio show and, <laughs> and talk. I would have been too terrified. And that I was able to overcome that and just have this vision during college and finally say, you know what, I'm going to do this. So even on days where I don't feel like making a video or I don't feel like going to work or waking up, I just think about, well, I could not be here because of that other experience back in college. Or I could just 
not have started this or come out of my shell to begin with. So now I think, and you've heard the popular quote, if you're thinking, what's the quote? If you're wonder, if you're not motivated at the moment, think about if you feel like quitting. All right, I got this. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you space. Let me start I'll over. Give you space. Let me start over. When you feel like quitting, think about why you started. And honestly, that's one of the biggest things that keeps me motivated, is just thinking about why I started doing this. And if I were to quit, people are still going to look at me as the guy who tried to be a motivational speaker, who tried to do something, but ultimately gave up because he didn't have the time or. Or whatever. So what advice do you have for me? I need some motivation because I really want to quit my job because I'm just over it. Like, this job? Did you just start that job? Yes, and I'm oh, over it job. already. So. What do you do and why are you over it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. With yeah, regards, she literally just started that job like not even a month or two ago. It's probably been just a month. Honestly, I don't Maybe know a month now. where you work. I don't know what you might not like about the job. But if you've been working there a month and you already hate it, First of all, I'd say look at why you might not like it. Do you not like the people? Because one of the biggest things when you work somewhere and you love the people you're around, that makes a big, big, big oh, difference. Oh, definitely, because that's what mm -hmm. kept me at my last job for so mm -hmm. long. But then do you also like what you're doing? And arguably more importantly, are you providing value in a way that you see, that you enjoy? Like, for example, are you just doing something that's, not providing big value or are you doing something that's actually helping someone in need a lot of times doing something like that can help you see the bigger purpose in what you're doing even if you don't like the actual day-to-day -day operations of the job what you're actually doing in the bigger picture can a lot of times help you stay motivated but when you're looking for something like if you already hate it i would suggest <laughs> looking somewhere else i mean there are Plenty of opportunities, plenty of ways you can network and meet other people. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I okay, look, you're in the field of media. So most of us have jobs because until media takes off, you got to work. Right. Yeah. So the reality yeah. becomes you find something either tolerable that you can do until you get where you want to go, or if you're fortunate enough to find something you like, then you do that. But the reality is, like you said, it's about the bigger picture. And in a bigger picture, you want to do radio. So you're probably going to have to work until radio jumps off. But you do the stuff that is actually in your vision on the side. So like for me, I have y'all know I work. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of like my job. I'm, I'm fortunate. I kind of like what I do. But I never let it get offset. So I'm here on Mondays. I'm here on Fridays. You know, I'm staying with you guys. We're doing stuff. Because in the grand scheme of things, my job will be gone tomorrow. But what I put the time in will last until I die. So I have a question for the both of you. Yes. So from the beginning to the end of both processes, like getting motivated and networking events, what what does it look like starting out? Like if I'm if I'm just I'm out, I'm down bad, out sad, I don't know what to do, I don't want to get up, I don't want to do anything. How do I go from point A to point Z with both? Like when will I know that I've I've accomplished something? Or when will I know like okay, well, like I've I've really got this networking thing down or like you know I'm really motivated I don't need to watch this video well not I don't need to watch these videos anymore but like Keep that watching. really helps me of course <laughs> yes we need those views honey but like I'm just you know what how do you, what does that look like what does that process look like Are you asking more from like not saying you want to be a public speaker or you just want to stay motivated for your personal goals Or how can I measure that like what can I when you're talking to people about like being motivated and trying to get them up and going, like how can I measure? Like, okay, like, what's well, the start? Yeah, like, it? cause some people I know for a lot of people it's just a matter of like the getting started is always the hardest part. You know, like some people With have to whatever. hit ground zero in order to be like, okay, I'm ready to get back up and start all over again. Like I have to push myself. Mm -hmm. Like you're looking for the extra push. Like. But Where's the start? Yeah, and then once you get there, a lot of people stop. It's the same thing with networking. Like, you go to these events, you might get all these, like, numbers. Business and cards. Yeah, and then you feel like you've reached a point where, like, okay, I got everything I need, and then you stop. Like, what do you, what would you say for, the, like, those I instances? think it falls to goals. It, it boils down to your goals. And this is why I tell people you have to be realistic when you set goals. Because you should have your short-term goals and your long-term goals. So let's stay with the example you gave. So let's say that your goal is you want to be a sportscaster. So your goal is, okay, I need to get in touch. I need to do the research, and I need to decipher, you know, who maybe somebody I want to idolize or somebody I want to be with in the room. So then I have to research that individual. So let's say it's, I don't know, and I, you know I don't do sports, so we'll say Sharon Sharp. I don't know what the sports thinking man. <laughs> I, I want to be in the room with Sharon Sharp. So then I start doing the research. Well, how did he get his start? You know, what did he do? Uh, things of that magnitude. Then you decide, okay, well, is he touchable? Can I actually be in a room with Sharon Sharp? Yeah. You do your research on that. And let's say you can't. 
okay, well, who is who is in his circle that I can get to? So then you research his circle. Oh, well, there's, I don't know, I'm just making up names. Cameron Johnson. Oh, I can get in the room with Cameron Johnson. He's going to be in Atlanta next week. Okay, so I need to get to this event. So this event costs $200. Okay, well, I have a job, so now I got to put. I got to make this $200 to get in the room with Cameron. That's your short-term goal. Your long-term goal is, okay, when I get in the room, what do I do? Like he would say, what do I do when I get in the room? Okay, well, I need, first of all, I need to get to get his attention. How do I get his attention? By the time you do all this stuff, you already started setting goals. So once you achieve it, then it's like, you know what? I was able to do that. So let's go on to the next. That was one small thing I was actually able to make happen. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like getting that momentum going. Because once you achieve your short-term goal, long-term goals don't seem as scary. And that's the part that people don't do. They don't do short-term goals. The main goal they would come with, I got to get in the room with Shannon, with Shannon Sharp. Well, that may never happen. He may not be in your circle. So you're going to get discouraged because it's not something you can obtain. Right. But if you can get into somebody in his circle in the room with them, the reality hits. Okay, well, I got in the room with them. I set all that up. I put that in motion. Maybe that is a feasible. I can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like for example, if I had a year ago started out and said, all right, my big goal is to be a guest star on Talk I IBNX. <laughs> and I couldn't just jump in here that's and say, hey, <laughs> that's something that's I want to do. Like. Ricardo would have been like, uh, so what do you do? What's your experience? Mm -hmm. Uh, well. Because I know. will ask that. I, oh, yeah. I do ask that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he wants to know. You got to be qualified. But. You just heard him <laughs> say earlier, he has her resume. So mm -hmm. <laughs> he's. Wow. I already know what they do. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, like you got to know what it is. Well, first of all, get that experience down. Mm -hmm. Like start small and have those little goals along the way. Like my first thing was. I was scared to post my first YouTube video thinking, oh, everybody's going to see me on video. That was my first big fear. And once I overcame that, then my next thing was, all right, maybe I'll invite other people or post it on LinkedIn and get other people's thoughts and opinions on my videos. And then I started the podcast. Now I invite other people and <clears throat> learn more about their career path and how it applies to what I'm doing and going back and forth on that. And then now... I'm here and I look to continue growing from there and getting more speaking opportunities and continue networking in order to do that. But I know where I want to go. I just know short-term goals keep you motivated in the short term. Mm -hmm. And it also takes a lot of discipline to get up and do the thing. Because wanting to do something, knowing what to do, those things are great. But if you don't do anything about it, then essentially that was just thoughts. Yeah. Like you did not create any value for yourself or anyone else well since we're on air right now i need a witness oh god <gasps> ricardo since you're you're the big boss um wait what yeah this person why, the, why you got papers in your hand what are you about doing you about to <laughs> <laughs> why are you picking up papers like what is happening right now i got nervous <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just like why are you picking up papers you, you don't call do your attorney <laughs> <laughs> right like why are you no picking up no papers? no remember when we first started we had a personal development plan yes and now that we're speaking about like goals and everything like that, I think that we should kind of like go back to that. So I want to hear this on air so everybody else can hear it. Well, that's too. not gonna happen today because we only have two minutes. No, I'm saying I just want you to agree that we're gonna oh. go back to this structure. You do realize you're the they're the only one that's not doing it's that. A, All the rest of them. They they are. They no. they've already done it. I'm never more than even. That I'm gonna say so. I'm gonna assume I'm already. I'm okay, already. so here's the problem. With, <laughs> here's the problem with correspondents versus actual interns. Okay. Uh, what I'm realizing now is I need to hold y'all to the same standard I hold them because they've already done all that. We've already sat down. Every intern has done this except you guys because I put y'all in another category. But I see we need to go back to that. That's fine. We can do that. So okay. on the air. We, I will send y'all that email. Y'all will fill it out. We will sit down and go over it like I do with the rest of the interns. Terry, did you just give me right. homework? <laughs> <laughs> yes, she did. So good I'm job, sorry, Terry. I'm sorry I need it. Come on, teamwork. Teamwork. Can okay, you please? No. All right, so we have one minute left. So final thoughts from Keith and Jordan. For me, I would say never assume that the grand goal that you have today is the grand goal you will have 10 years from now. Lay track now for the goal you'll have in 10 years. Once upon a time, I was director of, of, of programs at Georgia Tech. I met Ronald Reagan, Leonard Nimoy. I can give you a whole list of people that I met who were celebrities. I did not stay in touch with a single one of them. 10 years later, I wanted to produce movies. How cool would it have been for me to move to LA and say, hey, Lenny, I'm coming to LA. Let's have lunch. I couldn't say that because I didn't stay in touch with the guy. Keep a Rolodex. Stay in touch with people. Okay. All the up, baby. I would say my biggest piece of advice I want everyone to think about is who you're surrounding yourself with. 
Are you surrounding yourself with people that might not necessarily have the same goals as you, but do they support your goals and support what you're trying to do? Because if you surround yourself with people that don't support you and maybe make certain decisions that will not support where you want to be in the long term, which of course could change, but when you have that vision and other people, your closest friends, your family, tr bring you down and restrain you from where you want to go, that can be the biggest obstacle that you'd have to overcome. So surround yourself with the right people. Get people that are on your side because you're the average of the five people you're closest to. And you want those people to support you and push you forward rather than pull you back. All right, so that's the wrap for another lovely morning uh, Monday show with the correspondents and my special guests, Keith Ivey and Jordan Rubin. It's Rubin, right? Yes, sir. I mm -hmm. want to make sure. I, was like, I don't know if that was a Rubin. All right, so on Monday, we have we were talking about small businesses, uh, how you deal with them, um, small business loans, all that good stuff with Charlene. She's supposed to be here on Monday. On Friday, because now we have Friday shows, the interns are actually producing Friday. So I can't even say what Friday's going to be about, but you definitely should tune in because I promise you, all 17 of them, they got something good. So I will see you on mm -hmm. Friday from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. on the Leadership Plan with your host, Ricardo D. Rice. <laughs>